Welcome to part 10 of Enlightenment in a Revolutionary World. Now we're going to talk about Napoleon at War. Now, in the years leading up to the Battle of Trafalgar, you're going to see all sides kind of itching for a fight, right? By 1803, Napoleon is building up his army in the Netherlands. Uh, he's preparing another army for an invasion of Bologna, and he wants to invade England himself. Itself, The only thing standing in his way is the Royal Navy of Great Britain, okay? Now, he has a navy of his own. His French navy is in currently in the Mediterranean along with his current allies, the Spanish. But unfortunately, he has to get them to, from the Mediterranean to the English Channel. And standing in his way is Admiral Lord Nelson, right? So he's going to an attempt in 1805 to sail his navies out of the Mediterranean and get there. And Nelson had been a pain in Napoleon's side ever since the Battle of the Nile during his Egypt uh, days, right? <clears throat> so after months of pursuit and cat and mouse between these navies, Admiral Nelson will finally corner the French and Spanish fleet on the morning of October 21st, 1805, off Cape Trafalgar in Spain, right? The British fleet was about 27 vessels, right? It outnumbered the, uh, it was outnumbered by the French and Spanish fleet by about uh, three to two. And Nelson is going to engage a tactic that's pretty unconventional. He's actually going to allow the French and Spanish fleet, fleet to cross his T, right? Where he let them cross in front of their fleet, giving them full broadsides on them. But it gave him a position in two perpendicular uh, uh, columns to break through the, the British, uh, or through, excuse me, through the Spanish and, and French lines, right? And he's going to, uh, as a result, have a resounding naval victory. Now, Admiral Nelson himself will be picked off by a French sharpshooter during the battle, and he'll die after having captured 30 French or Spanish ships. Um, they are actually going to place him in a rum barrel to preserve his body while they transported him to uh, England for burial. They're literally going to turn them into a pickle. It was probably the funniest thing they ever saw. Though 1805 made Napoleon's plans for a British invasion at least uh, placed on hold, he turned his sights on Europe itself and began conquering much of continental Europe. His conquest is going to take about six years, and he's going to uh, be very successful. In 1805, Russia and Austria are going to join British in a coalition against Napoleon, but Napoleon is going to defeat Austria and the Russian armies at a place called Austerlitz, right? The result is going to be is Austria is actually going to surrender. They're going to be knocked out of the war after this. Um, in 1806, Napoleon is going to seize Naples on the uh, Italian boot. He's going to conquer the Netherlands. He's going to conquer much of the German states. As a matter of fact, he's going to dissolve the Holy Roman Empire, right? Dissolve it and consolidate the 300 German states into a smaller number of states and create what will be called the Confederation of the Rhine, right? Prussia will object to this, and the result of this is that the Napoleonic armies will uh, attack and destroy the vaunted Prussian army at a place called Jena, um, effectively knocking, again, Prussia out of the war and reducing Prussia to a client state. In 1807, Napoleon's going to defeat the Russians again, this time at a place called Friedland, right? The result is going to be the Treaty of Tilsit. In the Treaty of Tilsit, Alexander I recognizes Napoleon as the emperor of, West, of the West, right? and promises economic cooperation. And in return for doing this, Napoleon promises to leave Russia alone in the East. Well, at least for now, right? Napoleon will then seize Portugal. And in 1808, he'll invade Spain, um, throw the king out, and replace him with his brother Joseph, right? So by 1810, all of Western continental Europe, uh, all the way to the borders of Russia, was either ruled directly by Napoleon or was a client state ruled by one of his family members. Napoleon also began to consolidate his power um, politically and economically. Uh, he divorced his first wife. She was Empress Josephine. He divorced her in 1809. She hadn't given him a child. And he made a political marriage when he married the Archduchess Marie Louise. Uh, who was the daughter of the Austrian emperor. 
right? Uh, she will give birth to a son um, in 1811, which they'll, they will name Napoleon. Now, Britain is going, and their navy is going to be your, the only resistance left in Napoleon once he has this continental empire, right? It's going to be the only major power at war with him. So his continental system that he set up is designed to try and uh, uh, challenge uh, and break the British will, right? Uh, this is kind of a predecessor of the EU, right? It's Napoleon's plan to get around what he called the nation of shopkeepers, right? He devised it in 1806, and it was a tariff union, a common market for all Europe, right? So... If you're a member of the continental system, which pretty much all of continental Europe was, there's no tariff between the European states. Uh, all continental ports are closed to British goods, right? There's no Brexit because there's no Brentrance. Um, its uh, purpose is to make Europe economically self-sufficient and prosperous and encourage French industry, but also it's to choke off British trade, right? Uh, the continental system was very hard on British trade, especially during the harsh winter of 1810-1811, but the continental system was also hard on the continent itself. The British Navy blockaded Europe from all American agriculture, right, which helped bring about actually the War of 1812, right, and without that added, uh, that added uh, trade, French industry just couldn't keep up with the amount of demand that was uh, requested of it. Ultimately, this is gonna to lead to a growing descent in Europe itself, right? Uh, at first, European powers, uh, European people greeted the Napoleonic armies with enthusiasm because they thought, oh, they're gonna bring the ideas of the French Revolution. And some of this did come uh, with the Napoleonic armies, right? For example, Napoleon dismantled the Ancien Regime um, in the conquered territories. He abolished the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he abolished serfdom and sanguinorial dues and, he, and old trade barriers. Uh, he gave many nations the trappings of Enlightenment government. Uh, they had constitutions, written constitutions. They had legislatures, free public education. Uh, um, state-supported academies of arts, right? The Napoleonic Code, right? Uh, civil rights even for minorities like Jews and other groups. Um, but instead of liberating conquered people and then going away, Napoleonic forces stayed in one way or another. And the people began to resent things like the high taxes, the conscription of men into armies, the endless wars of conquest. The Napoleonic police state, right? The strict censorship of speech and the secret police. Uh, the, they resented the presence of French troops, the use of French language, the presence of French culture in their regions, right? Sometimes this resentment is even expressed culturally, like when uh, Beethoven uh, wrote uh, Fidelio, um, which was an opera. He also wrote music for Goethe's uh, play, uh, Igmont. Right. Both of these were triumphs of liberty when patriots are imprisoned by tyrannical powers for their beliefs. Right. Uh, other places, it got even further than that. Like, for example, in Spain, resentment was expressed by rebellion. Um, in 1808, Spain, aided by British troops commanded by a young English nobleman named Arthur Wellesley, uh, uh, or excuse me, Wellesley, uh, erupted into guerrilla warfare against the French army. Uh, in Italy, secret bands of nationalistic guerrillas called Carbonari, because of the charcoal marks that were placed on their forehead after their initiation, began conducting guerrilla attacks on French troops. Prussia quietly began to reform uh, the administ its administration and planned to resurrect its army in secret to be able to fight Napoleon in the fields. And Russia, who was expected to trade within the continental system, instead ignored it in favor for in favor of widespread smuggling between it and Great Britain right so there's a lot of different problems uh, that are developed by Napoleonic rule 